Um, most of all, the multilateral trade system mitigates the asymmetries of power in determining outcomes. As soon as you have a free trade agreement, especially between a powerful country and a, a weaker country, the asymmetries of power in those relationships come to the fore. Um, Oxfam UK did a fantastic paper on the so-called economic partnership agreements that the EU is trying to commit African, Caribbean, and Pacific Island countries to. Um, and I would urge, and I know Oxfam's not a sponsor, but I'm sure we're all fellows in this, uh, in this journey together. Uh, they, they really point out the inequities in these so-called free trade agreements and I want to make a case for the benefits of the multilateral trade system. Uh, now, in what ways does the negotiating trade rules through the WTO impinge very directly on development? Well, there's three obvious ways. First of all, the actual content of negotiating agendas is of vital interest to developing and least developed countries. Agriculture, we've talked about agriculture a lot tonight, and it's central. And um, in this respect, Australia has been, you all know, because we hear about the Cairns Group all the time, and with good reason, but um, Australia, the, the coalition for pushing for fair trade in the WTO effectively for the past uh, 20 years, led by Australia, actually consists of 15 other developing countries and least developed countries and, and three rich countries. So uh, this gives you a sense of, of in whose interest addressing the gross distortions in agricultural trade and the rich subsidy practices of the rich nations um, serves. The principles that actually guide negotiations in the WTO are um, of immense importance to developing countries. The principle of special and differential treatment, I promise it's the only acronym I'll use, is that uh, developing and least developed countries have different needs and have um, different interests in the global trade system. And therefore, they cannot be expected to um, um, comply with the rules and the obligations that might be expected of developed countries. This is a principle that is at the heart of the current Doha round of trade negotiations. And finally, the way in which the obligations are actually implemented affects developing countries. We have some very recent examples of, of bad examples. For instance, the, um, the TRIPS agreement, uh, which I'm sure many of you know about in relation to forcing um, poor countries to bring up their levels of intellectual property protection to those of, of much richer countries. It, it is to the, it is, that goes against their welfare interests. But to its credit, the WTO has grappled with this problem, has accepted that uh, there have been big mistakes in that agenda and is making recourse to um, change some of that. The WTO has also done much to address the needs of its poorest and its weakest members. The Seattle, the it, debacle at Seattle in 1999 was a watershed, and the WTO has moved a lot faster than many national governance in the world in making its um, trade policy development and negotiation processes more transparent, more inclusive, more accessible. Uh, and it it's provides a, a very um, telling object lesson to uh, many governments around the world. And as I've suggested, the membership and the secretariat are really, really grappling with this whole issue of trade and development. And of course, that's embedded in the current um, Doha Round agenda. Nonetheless, the, the multilateral trade system is facing immense challenges. And, and this is the bad news bit of the story. And you would be familiar with the headlines all the time about the death of the Doha round, which has sort of limped along for seven years, about the, the near death or near um, realization experience in July when ministers of the key nations came agonizingly close to an agreement that would have um, been the beginning of the end of a successful conclusion to the Doha round. And you read all the time the sort of uh, misery guts in the press saying it's, it's all going to hell in a handcart and it will never be finished, or in fact it's dead already. There's some evidence already of a growing backlash against trade liberalization in rich countries, which is um, a paradox at exactly the same time that developing countries are discovering and embracing um, the benefits of trade liberalization, there is a, a backlash, um, much more so in North America and Europe, actually, than in our neck of the woods so far. 
There's a ma major readjustment of power relations in the WTO. Uh, the US and the EU can't dominate any longer, and they're having a really hard time coming to terms with the um, influence of China and India, and to a lesser extent, Brazil. And this has, this has been a significant obstacle to, to the conclusion of the round. And finally, this proliferation of these um, free trade agreements, preferential trade agreements, creates a vicious circle. Because the Doha round's taking so long, governments are peeling off and negotiating these crummy little deals left, right, and center. Some of them are quite trivial and not terribly harmful. But some of them are harmful. And worse still, the fact that there's about uh, between three and 400 um, either notified, concluded, or in negotiation, it means that um, the, 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 the multilateral trade system loses momentum. And um, that is no longer the pointy end of doing business for governments that are concerned about the results they can bring home before the next election. Uh, for a government to say it wants to do something that's going to come good in seven or eight time, uh, seven or eight years' time, is to beg the sort of questions that the Millennium Development Goals also run into in terms of electoral cycles. Uh, last year, I had the great um, privilege of being a member of the Warwick Commission.